This conference will now be recorded. Um, so the Regional Center has started uh, doing evaluation. Some of you may even have had your uh, evaluation already. Uh, and uh, so they requested that we do some uh, going back and looking at uh, what the uh, 10 uh, rules related to um, home and community-based waiver service compliance is. Now, again, this may be redundant for some of you, but um, the home and community-based waiver um, was uh, put into place in 2014. Initially, there was five years for providers for, of day and residential services to come into compliance. Uh, with the change of administration, the, the, the new Trump administration decided to give providers an extra two years to uh, come into compliance. And then with uh, COVID, it, another couple of years were added. So it went from full compliance in 2019 to full compliance in March 17th of 2023. Now, everyone who is a provider for Kern Regional Center came into paper compliance by uh, March or shortly thereafter uh, of last year. Um, and so uh, we, uh, Regional Center was successful in letting the state know that yes, indeed, we've reviewed the uh, um, program documents at the facility. They've answered the questions that we've asked them and based on their answers, they're in compliance. Well, the federal government said, no, it, doesn't quite work that way. We want to see the, the actual uh, compliance on um, the uh, in, in person. So they, so California asked for a one-year extension, which the federal government granted. So starting in March of this year, regional centers we're supposed to, to start doing their evaluations on facilities. Uh, KRC got a little bit of a jump on it, has started already, and we are now in the phase that the federal government is requiring of all facilities need to be evaluated to make sure that they're meeting the requirements. Now, that evaluation, and uh, Leslie from Kern Regional Center has joined us, and so she can, uh, if she wants to, can share a little bit more. But that evaluation basically uses a state tool. You've all got that tool. You've, you've received it in the past, and we're going to discuss it a little bit today. And they're going to be looking at you, your records. They're going to be talking with you if you are the uh, administrator or owner of the uh, facility. And they're also going to be uh, potentially talking to your DSPs and the people who live in your home. Now, the people who live in your home are your the residents. Now, keep in mind that we attempt to use people first language in our presentations. And people first language is really moving towards individual serve. But in the current area, our local uh, client advisory group decided that they continued to like to use the term client um, to refer to them. So sometimes in my presentation, I will use that. And some people think that's an archaic term that we shouldn't be using it anymore. But that's in respect to the, our community. The best thing to do is to ask people how they want to be referred to. So uh, because if, it, if it really being people, uh, that means talking to the individual, asking the individual what, what it is that they would like to see in terms of how they refer to. And that way we can make sure that we, uh, we're being respectful of that individual in terms of how we treat them, how we talk about them, et cetera. So that being said, if throughout this presentation today, I use the term client, it's because there are some individuals in our community that prefer that we still use that term. You have gotta to try to use individual serve, but sometimes I go back to I, you know, my old way of uh, dealing with it and trying to be respectful for those individuals who prefer other names to refer to them. 
Um, this course is specifically for residential providers. Uh, last week, we offered this class for uh, uh, day and employment folks. And as such, we addressed six areas of home and community-based waiver. Today, we're going to address 10 areas. So there are four areas that are uniquely uh, for residential providers. So we're going to try to uh, talk about all 10 in the hour that we have today. And I'd like this to be as much as possible uh, a dialogue. So I'm going to ask some questions at times and try to get you uh, all to uh, pipe in because I don't want to be doing all of the talking. Um, first things first, uh, this um, this class, um, if, if you want continuing education, you must attend the entire webinar community of practice to obtain the, the uh, credit. You, you must identify yourself at the beginning of the presentation on the screen. So I see everybody who's on is it has identified themselves, but if anybody comes on by phone or doesn't identify themselves, uh, there's no credit involved. If more than one person, so if you have somebody else in your facility, a, a DSP, a co-administrator taking the course as well, and you're both sharing the screen, you need to put both names on or let uh, Valerie uh, Gomez know that there are more than one person on so we can give uh, credit. Um, one of the things that we do, because almost all of you do not have your uh, cameras on, and that's okay. I, I respect people's privacy, but that means you could be off, uh, you know, ironing or doing something else and you just put the camera on. So in order to make sure that you are really involved with this class, we do ask that you send in three areas that you learned today to uh, Irene at uh, um, Bakersfield ARC. And it could be just bullet points, to, but, but something that shows that you did get something out of this class today. And uh, finally, uh, if you're going to ask for credit, we ask that you do it within 30 days. It makes it so much easier for us to keep track of everything if we take care of things promptly. So please uh, respect that and do that. Now, for those of you who were on this webinar last week, uh, because it is so similar to, to the one that we did last week, you can only get credit one time. So if, you're if you submitted, if you took it last week, submitted something to Irene, you're going to get the certificate. You you won't get a certificate for today's class. If you if this is a good review for you, if you want to see the other four areas, perfect. We 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 love to have you. If any of you are on who are day or uh, vocational providers, we we welcome you as well. And we're going to discuss the first five that refer to you, and then number ten also refers to you. So it can be relevant for all providers. And so let's give it a shot. Now, first of all, has anybody here had their evaluation yet? Oh, you can just unmute and let me know. Oh, one hand went up. So uh, yeah, okay. So most of you have not uh, been been evaluated yet. Um, if you, uh, yeah, and then another person said yes in the chat. So. Um, it's starting. Uh, anybody want to make a comment or say anything about uh, the, the the process as they as they seen it? Yeah, uh, you know. Okay. Um. You have uh, Shannon with her hand up. If she okay, go ahead. Shannon. Yeah, just unmute yourself. Hi guys. Um, so we did have our first uh, HCBS visit last Friday. We have another one this Friday for, and this is for the FHA homes. Um, the KRC liaison came to the home, and we started with just a brief walkthrough of the home. She did check to see if there were, um, if the bedroom doors had locks. Um, she did state that if the individual does not want the lock on the door, just to make sure it is documented everywhere, you know, in the ISP, the IPP, 
Um, I think we also did it on uh, on the residence agreement as well um, because because of the addendum there. Um, then after the walkthrough of the home, she didn't she didn't do a full check like she does for our audits. Like they didn't they don't go through emergency supplies. They don't check like for band aids or um, what is it the first aid kits or anything. She just you know yeah. <laughs> yeah doesn't none of that. Um, just did you know a walkthrough. I don't even think we went in the backyard. Um, and then we just proceeded to sit at the dining room table for the remainder. Um, uh -huh. One of the individuals did not wish to partake, so he was he just stayed in his room. Um, the other one answered her questions. She asked a few to the PSCC. She asked a few to me as the PD. And it does take, well, we only had one individual participating, but it still took about two, two and a half hours. Because yeah. it's like it's, a 50, it's... yeah, it's like a 50 question thing that she's flipping through. And they're trying to, minimize it but right now that's what dds provided to them and a lot of the questions are redundant and just kind of in a slightly different way <laughs> see if we have the same answers maybe um let's see oh and then my question to her was what if the individual wants the lock the doors locked but a conservator does not she did state that the conservator overrides the individual's preference mm -hmm. That's, that's correct. Um, um, now, one of the other things about uh, locks or, or not locks is that even if a client says, I don't want a lock on my door, they still have a right to privacy. And if their door is closed, you still right. need to knock and uh, yeah. Correct. Um, and then, uh, so in the binder, all they checked was the residence agreement, the client's rights, the grievance procedure, and then make sure that the current IPP is in there. And if it's expired, that the IPP signature sheet was in there. And okay. that was all that was all they looked for. Okay, so it, it, that gives you a little bit of a flavor for the rest of you. Thank you, Shannon, for, for sharing that with us um, mm -hmm. of what the KRC evaluation is like. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, if you're following uh, the uh, home and community-based rules and, you know, Title 17, Title 22, uh, it should go fairly smoothly. You know, if you, if you have some challenges, uh, the, uh, from what I've been told by a regional center, they want to help you to get it uh, straightened out. And so if they can give you like almost like a fix-it ticket or something and you get it done, that's great. If not, they have to go to a corrective action plan. And this, the, the feds and, and DDS are fairly clear about the procedure that you go through if you're not in compliance. And it, and it, and it keeps sort of ratcheting up until uh, it gets into uh, only half payment for your facility and then ultimately de-vendorization. De so I don't want anybody to have to go in that direction. So by all means, if there's any challenges that you have, uh, get them uh, corrected. Or the other option you have is that there is an appeals procedure in Title 17. So if you feel that, wait a minute, it's a matter of interpretation and that the uh, regional center individual who came out and did the evaluation didn't fully understand what you're doing and you feel that, that you're meeting the, the, the requirements, the spirit of uh, HCBS and how you're doing it, or this was a client preference, you know, uh, then you can appeal to uh, the director of the current regional center uh, consistent with the uh, uh, vendor appeals process that's in uh, Title 17. Um, I guess I okay. have one more. I guess I have one more question for Shannon. Um, when you each individually were talked to or asked questions, did you have your own time with them? Was it like you went and sat over while they talked to the individual that you had in the home? I guess I'm kind of interested in regarding that. Um, we actually all just sat at the dining room table together. The mentor was on one end, um, the KRC liaison, the individual, the PSCC, and myself were all at the dining room table. Okay, nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on. Thanks again, Shannon. Uh, 
the um Okay, um, the um, trainings that are being provided through this grant are not only do, do we have these two webinars uh, a month on community of practice, and we also have a webinar next week, which uh, will be changed. It was originally health and safety. It's now going to be uh, person-centered uh, uh, planning according to what the feds are requiring. Um, but uh, these are some of the classes, and I'm going to go through these really fast because we want to make sure we have a lot today to cover. Um, Person-centered thinking, well, one was this last week, uh, but then there's another one coming up on June uh, 25th. I took the one this last week. Very good. If you really want to, to get a introduction, this is not the full person-centered planning process. Kern Regional Center does offer uh, a training in that, and I see John Noriega is on today. He's one of the two trainers that's involved with that. I would strongly encourage you to do that, but that's a much more involved uh, process than, than what this was. This is just an introduction. Um, coming up also, uh, Everyone Has Rights. That's coming up uh, tomorrow, so that if any of you would like to register for that, there's the registration site, or go back to the um, Newsletter that was sent out in early February, and that will give you this address, or you can call Valerie and she can give you the information. She'll probably put it in the chat for you right now. Um, and that's also going to be offered on May 14th. And this really uh, goes into depth about uh, client rights. Uh, then uh, on March uh, 4th and uh, through the 8th, there's a POM workshop. That is now full. There are no more uh, slots available for that. Uh, March 28th, Exploring Communication. For those of you who have clients who do not communicate verbally, uh, who uh, you have limited uh, verbal expression, who you sign, who have other ways of communicating other than the traditional, what I'm doing right now, um, this is a really good uh, course in terms of looking at uh, uh, some of, it's an introduction to uh, exploring communication in other formats or, or means. Um, April 18th, the three E's, the foundation of informed choice. Uh, and I always get this wrong. It's it, it, education, uh, exposure, and what's the third one, Valerie? Education experience exposure experience okay so yeah but what that's all about is you know, it, it, when you're trying to sh share new ideas with clients new events new 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 things that you can do for someone uh that there's a whole process you can go through to really uh um make sure that people are making a, a choice that is informed uh, then uh again person-centered thinking on the 30th uh community building connections on may 30th and then embracing the dignity of risk on June uh, uh, 13th. Now, all these courses are being offered by, it says CQL, CQL stands for uh, Council uh, on uh, Quality Leadership, or, or Commission, excuse me, on uh, Quality and Leadership. And uh, they're a national organization. They do accredit facilities and what have you, and they work with both uh, development disabled and uh, be behavioral slash mental health uh, organizations. And uh, they're an excellent provider. Uh, if you were to take these classes um, um, online, go to their website, they're $100 a class. So you can get these classes free through this training. They're, they're limited to 40 people. The last couple we've had, we haven't had our full 40. So there's still time that you can sign up for any of these uh, uh, classes. Very good. And they they have videos. They give they give you material at the end. They they uh, give you a whole list of things that can be helpful uh, under that particular topic. So I strongly encourage you to uh, take advantage of this excellent resource. Um, uh, the the greatest uh, uh, problem with communication is the illusion that it occurred. So sometimes when we're communicating, we don't always. We think we're communicating, but it may or may not be the case. Statistically, about 50% of what I share with you today, you will actually hear and understand and move on. And then a lot of what I share, and I also talk fast, but the, uh, will uh, you, you, you won't pick up or or won't it won't stick with you. So 
it's very important that when you doing through this going through this process that we, we, we all listen and, and hear each other and talk with each other and really move forward with that. Okay, you all received this in, in uh, 2022. Some of you filled it out back then. Some of you uh, didn't start working on it until the regional center contacted you and said, "Hey, wait a minute, this is a uh, past due." And uh, but but it all but but all of you got it done. And this is a really good tool to go back and look at. So when when it comes time when when regional center calls you up. Hey, we're coming uh, coming over to, to evaluate you. Uh, I would strongly encourage you to look at this document and um, uh, see what you what your answers were, and also if you've updated anything. So what you were doing then and what you're doing now are are are, are, are in any way different. Um, go ahead and make sure that you uh, share that with the uh, the team that comes out, so that you get the um, uh, the full evaluation that it, it that shows where you are today because what the what it is is kind of like if I take out my cell phone and take a picture that's a snapshot that's right now and that's what they're going to be looking at is they're going to be looking at what's going on in your facility today so what you put down a year or two years ago may not be the same as what you're doing now so go ahead and make sure that when the evaluation team comes out they get a good flavor for what's going on today in your facility um, okay um, now th these are the 10 rules we're gonna like I said we got about a uh, uh, 40 minutes to go through them so hopefully we'll get this done in time um, the first one is access to the community the setting is integrated in and supports full access of individuals receiving uh, Medicaid home and community based services to greater uh, community, including. So, you want to make sure that when you give folks access to the community, that includes an opportunity to seek employment or work in competitive integrated settings. Now, your residential facilities are not day services, but if an individual in your program says, Hey, I would like to work. Uh, then you want to uh, encourage them. You want to work with their, uh, your, your, the, the uh, liaison from a uh, current regional center, uh, possibly with the program that they're in, if that program has a work component, or, or maybe the, the, the client needs to be referred to a different uh, uh, opportunity through the uh, vendorization process to an employment provider. Uh, so you want to do that. The other thing about uh, options for employment is that a lot of employment is not uh, eight to five Monday through Friday. So that a lot of our clients uh, work uh, weekends, they work uh, evening shifts, maybe early morning shifts. And I've had sometimes a provider say, oh, well, you know, everybody lights out and everybody goes to bed at nine o'clock here. And so we can't have uh, George coming home at 1130 uh, having worked a shift that goes to 11. That's that that's too uh, disruptive for our facility. Uh, no, it, you have to make accommodations to that individual's work schedule as part of your program. So you want to be you want to be encouraging, not discouraging uh, work. Uh, one of the other challenges that sometimes uh, happens, and I've seen providers uh, try to discourage individuals from working is that in some cases, if the client's wages go beyond a certain threshold, then they start uh, uh, taking money out of their SSI. And it's usually $2, I mean, $1 for every two that you make, and the threshold is usually $65. And if any of you are interested, Valerie can give you a whole uh, presentation on that because she's uh, certified in that. But anyways, uh, the uh, so some providers, and then the client has to pay a share of their residential and some pro providers don't want to deal with that. They just like to get the money from the payee or from, from regional center or, or whoever the uh, funds for the, the client's uh, uh, costs of residential services are. And they don't want to have to have the client pay them as well, or they, or the individual serve paying them as well. So th that sometimes is a barrier too, but it shouldn't be. I mean, we, we that can be worked out. Um, opportunities to see, okay, engage in community life. We want our people to be out and about in the community uh, and participating. 
So if uh, someone says they want to go to a particular uh, church, uh, you know, maybe working with the uh, pastor, the reverend, the minister, um, and um, getting them to help uh, integrate that person into the service. So they're not only going to the service, but if there's a, a little like brunch type thing afterwards that, that the uh, individual served is fully participating in those services and is part of that community. Uh, controlling personal resources uh, that uh, if the individual is, has P&I funds that they have some control over their, their funds. And I know this sometimes is a challenge that uh, providers have told me in the past, well, I give the, the, this individual uh, uh, $25 and comes back with really nothing. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm supposed to be keeping accounting for their his, his funds. And I can't really show where his funds went because it, you know, uh, um, it, it, there's nothing really there, no receipts, no anything. So it does become a challenge. And you as a licensee may have rules that for, for a community care license, regional center may be coming out and looking at it too. But, and this is one that sometimes can create a little bit of a challenge for you as a provider. But again, the client does have a right to control their personal resources. Um, receiving, receiving services in the community to the same degree and access to individuals not receiving uh, Medicaid HCBS. Now, in the regional center system, we've always talked about generic services. In other words, the person with the disability or the, with the uh, eligible to, for regional centers should get the same services that anyone else gets. So for example, a, a number of years ago, we had some uh, uh, individuals who tried to receive uh, services through uh, uh, the current county behavioral health and behavioral health and don't, they're your regional center client, you should get your services through regional center. Well, no, that client's eligible for both. And, you know, it got worked out and, and, and there's a good, there's a good cooperative relationship now between the two agencies. But at, the, at one point, there was a misunderstanding. But we really want, it, if your client's getting older, they should be able to participate in the senior center. If they want to uh, go to, uh, let's say, north of the river has an activity uh, that uh, where they're teaching uh, intro to guitar and the client wants to be involved with that, they should have the same rights as anybody else in the community that's coming to that class to learn that particular uh, event or skill or to use it if they want to go uh, to a movie or bowling or any other uh, activity same as anyone else in the community um, choice of settings now, this is important for especially for residential type settings uh, the setting is selected by the individual individual among setting options and in many cases the people that are in your facility have been with you for a number of years that if there was a choice made, and there may or may not, and the client might just have been told this is where you're going to be living, or they may have been shown some options, they may or may not have had a full choice in the past. That doesn't mean they don't have a choice now and in the future too. So if a individual is living in your program and voices a concern and talks about wanting to live somewhere else or would like to see other facilities or residential type settings or uh, uh, maybe even uh, supported living settings they have a right to do that uh, so non-disabled uh, specific settings and options for a private unit in a residential setting again options for a private unit may not be practical if you're let's say a six bed facility and you've got two people to a room and they've been there for a number of years but if that client really wants that that individual wants that they can ask uh, to be uh, to look maybe at a different facility that, that does have individual uh, rooms um, um, and and you really want to try to it was mentioned earlier about documenting uh, that, that that this has occurred uh, with, with the with the door uh, knobs that the client didn't want to lock. Document also that, that this is what the client's preference is that the, doc, the client continues to want to live in your facility, and that way there isn't an issue of uh, that that you, this client wasn't given a choice. 
and we want to make sure we're giving uh, clients a choice of where they will live. Um, are based on the individual needs and preferences of the that individual. So, so everyone gets to decide. This is what I want. This is what I don't want. So the client who went into the uh, group home and the provider informed the client the first week that everyone in my church goes to a Bible study on Tuesday night and everybody goes to my uh, congregation on Sunday, uh, that may not have been that person's preference or choice. And so that what really wasn't a choice and setting for that individual. So you want to make sure that if, if, if you have an individual who says, no, I belong to a different faith, I would rather go to uh, this uh, congregation uh, or uh, I don't want to go to a congregation at all, uh, then you're going to need to make the arrangements uh, for that. Um, for residential settings, resources, resources available for uh, room and board. Um, right to be treated well. Uh, ensure an individual's rights to privacy. So again, this whole issue about uh, if the, the client uh, wants a lock on their door or uh, uh, Leslie told me a story not too long ago about going out to one facility and the client said, yeah, here's my key to my door. And not only does this fit my door, but it fits the door of everybody else in the facility. Well, that's not necessarily assuring privacy, and that's not what we, we want to do. Uh, there are some uh, concerns about locks that uh, are like for bathroom locks where you can take like a uh, little screwdriver or something, push the button, and it, it opens up. Uh, those, those are probably not as good as a, a full-on you know, lock with a key. And uh, you know, I talked to one provider who said, you know, I've, uh, I have clients who may misplace their key or lose it so we've gone to a, uh, a touchpad or a fingerprint uh, you know they're, they're, they're more expensive but that's another option too if that's if, if that becomes an issue uh, dignity and respect uh, freedom from coercion or restraint um, i recently heard about a situation where a uh, individual talked to uh, i guess a, a family member about uh, something about a particular uh, person who worked for that facility uh, and, and some event that occurred that uh, that family member then talked to the owner of that program and evidently they, they talked to the staff person staff person then went back to the individual and said you don't rat on me again yeah. And that was clearly uh, a type of uh, coercion. You know, a, a client's rights were violated. The client wasn't being treated well because they, they, they uh, you know, are should be able to share what they like and what they don't like, and not feel like they're going to be penalized for doing it. Uh, so that was a violation of the of, of their rights, and uh, it really it wasn't allowing for freedom. Um, Independence, uh, optimizing, but does not uh, regiment individuals. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that people can have as many choices about what they want to do as possible. Uh, autonomy and independence in making life choices. Exactly. So that's where we're at. We we want our individuals to feel like they're a decision maker. When when I first started in the field, uh, we as caseworkers made all the decisions for people you know uh, adult clients didn't make very very few decisions about their life we we, we sort of decided for them i, I remember the uh, first uh, individual i uh, was uh, providing services to who wanted to move out on her own and i didn't want her to because you know i i knew best it was i was the decision maker well guess what she decided that she was and she did and you know and it turned out great but that wasn't the thinking back then. Today, we want to make sure people have choices about what they want to do. And again, we, as much as possible, we want those to be informed choices where they really fully understand both the uh, opportunity and the risk that's involved. So we go back to those three E's again that we talked about a little bit earlier this morning. I encourage you to uh, take that particular uh, CQL class that specifically talks about uh, the, the um, how you go about making sure that choices are informed for individuals and that they fully understand 
what they're um, attempting or want to look forward to, um, including but not limited to daily activities, physical environment, and with whom they interact. Now, so this is, you know, um, where we really want to uh, make sure that clients uh, have their right to, you know, uh, their daily activities, uh, uh, the, the physical environment. So if they say that they don't want to be here anymore, they want to be somewhere else, that's part of that. And with whom they interact. Now, this can be a little bit challenging sometimes. So, you know, uh, I had a uh, uh, consumer years ago who came home from their program and they had they used the get bus system and uh, they brought in a stranger with them and said oh here's uh, George George and I are best friends you know he, he, he's gonna be my boyfriend you know uh, and uh, you know she just met this person on the bus you know so uh, you know again they have a right to whom they interact with but then you as a provider have certain responsibilities to maintain a safe household and is really this in the person's best interest to be um, picking up a stranger on the bus and bringing them home. Uh, so, uh, you know, these are where you as a provider need to, on a daily basis, and sometimes multiple times during the day, uh, be thinking on your feet and really be working and weighing these uh, um, home and community-based uh, requirements and uh, but then also title 17 and title 22 and hopefully they're all in sync with each other but sometimes you know uh, safety and protection get involved and you need to sort of back up a step or two and then work with that individual on again what is really informed consent and was this a good choice in terms of uh, what you're doing so uh, independence uh, comes with uh, you know uh, it should be responsibility and the client should be helped to to uh, I fully understand what it is that they're um, the choices that they're making. Um, choice of services and supports uh, facilitates the individual regarding services and supports and who whom provides them. Now, again, another challenge uh, that clients have a right to where they live, who they live with, and who provides them the service. Now, if you're a uh, provider who has uh, individuals working for you during the day, so you have staff and you know that in today's current labor situation, there's high turnover, uh, people are leaving, uh, going to uh, get jobs that are better jobs, uh, starting, uh, I believe next month, uh, uh, fast food industry in California is gonna go to $20 an hour, uh, so uh, the, the, the competition uh, for uh, people who are working in your facility may be greater, you know, they better compensation somewhere else. So when um, Susie says, well, when I need assistance with my daily living skills, I really want uh, Mary to be doing it. Well, Mary may or may not, you know, be on the same shifts that, you know, that, that are involved with when Susie gets her uh, self-care, uh, Mary may end up uh, leaving your facility and going to work uh, you know, somewhere else or you know, leaving the field. Uh, so, you know, clients should be given a right to provide for who helps them. Uh, think about that yourself. If you need assistance with uh, something that involves uh, the, uh, intimate uh, parts of your body and hi i'm jeff i'm the uh, brand new person working in the facility here and i'm going to help you today sam uh, and uh, sam's never met me before and yet he's you know the expectation is that he's going to feel comfortable with a, a in essence stranger uh, assisting him with his personal care that can be a challenge so whenever possible you want to have uh, the, the the individual making choices about who supports them. Um, now, the residential agreement, um, when the feds first went out, and especially with some of the uh, larger uh, corporate providers, there weren't always admissions agreements. That sometimes there was, uh, you know, and the federal government said, no, there needs to be, a, in essence, a rental agreement 
uh, kind of like a rental, uh, a, a rental contract or a lease uh, for every individual who is in your facility. And um, so they um, um, decided that there needed to be, uh, the, the unit or dwelling a specifically physical place can be owned, rented, or occupied under legal enforceable agreement by the individual receiving services and the individual, and I don't know why I did that, but somehow that's cutting off part of it. Um, but let's go back. Um, the, but there needs to be an admissions agreement, and that's what works right now. So when the regional center comes out and is reviewing your paperwork, one of the things that they're gonna look for pretty quickly is that you have an admissions agreement. And there is a standard admissions agreement that's been his, sort of historically used, and that's acceptable right now. Uh, Leslie, are they still looking at trying to develop a new statewide uh, document that can be used? So they are still at the drawing table with it. They have a, a version that hasn't been approved just yet, so it's still pending additional reviews and recommendations. Uh, some regional centers have taken it upon themselves to create other versions too. And so we're seeing that as well to see the options that we have available, but that's where we're at currently. Uh -huh. uh, does anybody here uh, use an admissions agreement other than the one that uh, uh, current regional center provides for you? Okay, so everybody's using the, uh, currently using the regional center uh, agreement. Um, and uh, the, the clients have the same rights to protection against eviction uh, and landlord tenant laws that anyone else does. So the same laws that apply to you if you're a renter or have a lease on a property apply to the residents of uh, a community care facility, a mentor home, a, a small family home, group home, etc. Uh, for settings in which the landlord tenant law does not apply, the state must ensure that the lease residential agreement or other form of written agreement will be a place for each participant and the documents provide protection to address eviction. So you cannot summarily evict a individual from your facility. Now, historically, um, what has been required is that you give an individual 30 day notice if you're going to uh, you know, ask that person to leave your facility. And then you work with your uh, facility liaison from the regional center. Uh, if the client has family or other folks involved, you work with them and you really try to make sure that the uh, transition is, is good transition. In some cases, and again, this is historically, I'm not sure how regional center and licensing is doing it as we speak, but where you can give a three-day notice and that has to do with when an individual is a danger to themselves or others and for example they're you know breaking up your home they've injured uh, them, uh, themselves another uh, resident uh, you're just not able to provide the level of intensity that this person needs at the moment and so a more restricted setting is what's really uh, uh, appropriate for this person. The same thing could, could happen if uh, maybe their uh, medical condition uh, changes overnight. So a client who maybe has a heart attack or a stroke or something that makes it so that they need a higher level of care, then the 30 days doesn't necessarily uh, uh, apply in those situations. But you do need to have a residential agreement, and that's something that the, they will be looking at very carefully when they come out to your facility. Um, now, privacy is another really important area uh, for residential facilities. Each individual has privacy in his or her sleeping uh, living unit. So again, the, the uh, uh, units have entrance doors lockable by the individual with only appropriate staff having keys to doors as needed. Uh, again, uh, I heard about a situation not too long ago where a uh, uh, provider put the locks on the doors and um, so now, and then when uh, someone was out at the facility, they noticed that the provider uh, just went to the client's door, unlocked it, and walked in. 
that didn't announce, didn't knock, didn't you know, say, can I, may I come into your room? Because the provider also had a key. Uh, so there really was no privacy there. There was a lock, but that you, so that you have to make sure that it's not only just a lock, but there's also an assurance that uh, the, the, the individual's privacy is respected. Um, individual, individual sharing units have a choice of roommates in that setting. And again, some of you have had uh, residents for many, many years, and they've been roommates together for quite some time. But it is a question that needs to be asked, uh, you know, at, at very minimally at the annual review and probably on an ongoing basis. Uh, you know, is this still a good living arrangement for you? And this is what is this what you want? Um, individuals have the uh, freedom to furnish and decorate their sleeping or living units. Uh, within the lease or other arrangements. So if the client wants to put things on the wall, they can do that. I had, a, again, a, a client who, a uh, young uh, man who wanted to put some uh, posters of scantily clad women up on his wall. And the uh, provider said, no, we're a, a, a very religious home and we don't, you know, we don't think that, you know, and we believe in modesty uh, and that's not appropriate for this home. Well, it's client's room. They have a right to uh, make choices about their room. Has anybody had issues with the privacy uh, concerns or with locks on the doors? You can unmute and, or, and speak up. I'd like to share a story if there's no one else. <laughs> so um, the other day I was talking to one of my coworkers who had just did a visit and they had known the individuals in this home for many years now. And they were just amazed to see the pride that individuals had to have that key to show off their bedroom, to show that they could lock their bedroom door. And it, they were just so amazed to see the pride in that individual, to have that ownership of their bedroom, to be able to uh, lock it whenever they pleased. And they were, they were just so excited. They would leave the room, they locked their door, They'd go to the bathroom, they'd go to the living room, and then when they would, would want to come back to their bedroom door, they would unlock it and they would enter. And so, like, these individuals took so much pride in having their own key. And I think it's just beautiful that these individuals have that opportunity now. This may have never been a discussion prior to HCBS coming into play. And so, it's just amazing to see these kind of things happen. Well, you know, it, it, Leslie and, and, and group, um, it was actually almost the opposite that years ago when I was involved, um, there was always the concern about health and safety, that what if there was an emergency? What if there was a fire? How would the uh, provider be able to get into that uh, individual's room to uh, uh, assure their safety? And uh, so... Uh, yeah, this is a new concept in terms of wait a minute clients have a right to their own uh you know privacy and um the uh one one challenge i did hear about uh though was uh, a an individual who uh, was considered to be non-ambulatory i mean their their ability to leave a building on a system case of emergency was an issue and there was a door in their bedroom that went to the outside and so in case of emergency, the staff could go in uh, and assist that individual to get out through the door in their room. And I'm not sure how that compromise was, was addressed, but uh, you know, there, there was a, you know, still a need for privacy, but there, uh, again, a health and safety concern that, that came into play. Um, that is a very good point, Jeff. I'd just like to add for that one. So like with these new rules, um, for having locks on doors, it's always good to train your staff and to do um, uh, trainings in regards to like when doing a, a fire drill, like uh, ensuring that the staff have the keys, the access to be able to support the individuals with those doors um, in those emergency settings. So it's always good to practice with that, to keep that in mind as you guys uh, train your staff as well. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um... This next one can be a, 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 a major challenge for uh, providers of care. Uh, individuals have the freedom and support to control their own uh, schedules and activities and have access to food at any time. 
Now, how have some of you addressed this issue of having access to food at any time? Anyone want to, any takers on this one? Okay, uh, Shannon, go ahead. Um, well, the kitchen shouldn't be locked uh -huh. unless there's unless there's a doctor's note, because we do actually have an individual that is restricted because he would just go raid the entire kitchen in the middle of the night. Um, so as a solution, the cabinets are locked per the doctor's order and the in individual has a small basket of his preferred snacks that is left to his convenience. So the way you, there were two issues there. One of the, you wanted to continue to maintain the client's right to have access at any time, but you also wanted to uh, go with the medical order, which right. says Limit that- the access. Is, yeah, that, that uh, so yeah, yeah. So for those of you who have uh, uh, individuals who, let's say, uh, have uh, high cholesterol, uh, blood pressure issues, uh, diabetes, where diet is part of their uh, uh, medically uh, prescribed uh, lifestyle, uh, this can be a challenge. And again, uh, being creative, like Shannon just said, it really makes a huge difference in terms of giving people respect, giving them a right to uh, food and access to uh, the kitchen, but also uh, you know, meeting the restrictions that are, are necessary. And the story I've, uh, I've shared recently was, you know, uh, the um, uh, individual who uh, has access to the community and, uh, and goes out like consistent with HCBS rules, has their own funds consistent with HCBS rules and goes to 7-Eleven and buys a big gulp and uh, a huge Snickers and is diabetic. Uh, so as a provider, how would you handle a situation like that? That's so they come home and, you know, they've got half of a big gulp left and a chunk of the, uh, of their Snickers. And, you know, you, you see this as their provider. Uh, what would you think about doing with that person? Again, thinking on your feet, you're, you're, you're having to, you know, uh, yeah, they have access to the, the community, they have access to their food, uh, but consistent that food that they chose if you want to call it food uh is isn't uh, appropriate uh, according to their uh medical uh, prescription anybody yeah, you know, I got one on? Oh. yeah hi ahead. jeffrey this is rose i just was gonna say um we do have individuals that have medical conditions and i think to best meet their rights and their choices, right? Is to maybe take them shopping and teach them if you're diabetic, maybe these are preferred, maybe you wanna get the sugar-free soda versus the soda with all the sugar, right? It's having those coachable moments, I think, and guiding, but having maybe better cho food choices available for them to better meet their health and well-being. Right. That's great. That's a yeah. great uh, option. And again, going back to the three E's of providing education, exposure, and <laughs> what's that, Shannon? Experience. 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 Yeah. So, so, so really, you said sitting down with the client, teaching them what it is, taking them out in the community, like you said, showing them, like in the grocery store, in in a uh, go to Seven Eleven, and say, wait a minute, this is something that. Uh, mm -hmm. here, 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 here's nuts, you know, and, and, and we're, we're, uh, especially ones that are unsalted. Maybe this is a better choice for you than mm -hmm. is th that uh, Snickers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you, re you really look at the moment and, and, and as you said, look for the teachable moments that we can use to assist clients. Um, I'd also like to comment on this one um, through uh, CQL, you know, they um, make sure they remind us about the dignity of risk and letting those individuals know that if you continue on this path, these are the negatory things that can happen. So letting them know that they have that informed decision, but they have they have to choose what they want ultimately. 
Yeah, unless, they make sure. like, unless it's something, of course, I see doctor related and they're very specific to it. But um, there are some that just choose to do it, knowing that, you know, it could be a bad habit that can lead to something that's uh, really bad. Right. I think and it's we the have, same choice we, we all have, right? If we have right, that well, choice. People, people, people still smoke in this day and age. People, uh, you know, some people uh, drink excessively. You know, not, now that uh, marijuana is legalized, uh, you, you read in the paper about people who, who've developed an addiction to that. So there's a lot of different things out there that people can do that aren't necessarily in their best lifestyle. But, you know, we're part of why we're in this business is to help people and get them to try to lead uh, as community based of a life as possible and, and a healthy lifestyle. Too. Uh, when um, I first started working in this field, uh, you know, the life expectancy of someone who, let's say, had Down syndrome was like not more than 14 to 18 years. And with the advancements that have occurred uh, with, uh, you know, uh, heart care, cardiac care, uh, lung care, et cetera. Uh, now the lifespan is into the 50s and 60s, and we're seeing uh, individuals uh, with Down syndrome who are developing dementia. We would have never thought that would be the case when I first started, uh, you know, 40 some years ago. And uh, and if you look at the the chart that that shows the life expectancy, it's gone straight up. You know, because because we've made changes to how we do things. And so on an individual basis, our clients do not get the best healthcare to begin with. And there are some lifestyle issues that just to contribute to that as well. So as much as possible, we want to try to uh, be an active participant in that and helping them. Um, and then uh, right to visitors. Uh, individuals are able to have visitors of the choice at any time. Uh, has anybody had a concern about this? Had anybody uh, had somebody knocking on the door at 11 o'clock at night <laughs> saying, I want to see George, you know? Well, good. I'm glad that, that that hasn't been a concern. But this can be a concern that, that clients do have a right to their visitors. But again, you know, as as the example I used earlier, uh, the the individual that uh, the resident of your home just met on the bus this afternoon, and they, they want to have that person in their room privately. You know, and uh, you, we we have no idea who this person is. You know, maybe they're wearing an ankle bracelet that, uh, you know, as part of their probation, you know, or whatever. We, you know, we, we don't know. Um, anyways, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is the last slide. It's almost 10 o'clock. Um, the uh, setting is physically accessible to individuals. And this not only means, uh, you know, uh, that there's ramps and, you know, for the, physically handicapped, but also if you have individuals who have communication issues, that you have uh, the equipment necessary the, the, uh, so that they, if they want to communicate with families using a TTY or uh, need extra assistance or Braille or you know, sign language, uh, that uh, those uh, uh, things are available to them as needed. Any questions on that? Okay, any final questions for uh, Leslie, Valerie, or I before we uh, end the session? Okay, again, next week uh, there's a change in the agenda. It says uh, on the newsletter that it was going to be on health and safety, but it will be on the federal requirements for individual planning. So we'll review what the feds say about doing individual planning as part of uh, home and community-based uh, services. Uh, and until then, if you're, any of you are coming on, uh, we'll see you uh, next week, uh, that's the 29th or, or 28th, the leap month. Yeah. All right, you, everyone take care, have a good day, be safe, bye-bye. Thank you, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Thank you everyone who participated today as well.